How's everybody doing on this Sunday night? Hope everybody's doing good. Uh, tonight is my eighth discussion. Uh, I'll be speaking with Matt Servin of Backstabbers Incorporated, Northern Curse, As I Bleed, Life Passed On, Messiah. Um, just waiting for Matt to come on. Super excited about this. I haven't talked to him in, in ages. Um, should be fun. All right, let's get him on here. Matt, how are you doing, my friend? Good, how are you? Good, not bad at all. Uh, I want to thank you for doing this. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a long time since I've seen you face-to-face, uh, -face, so uh, I just want to thank you so much for doing this, and um, I appreciate you taking the time out to, to do this. Absolutely. I was uh, very excited to do this, and um, just honored, really. I mean, the fact that people would care, I guess, still. So, thank you. Um. So basically, um, I've just been doing this, talking about, you know, the hardcore scene, mostly in New England, but I've been talking to other, other people from other, um, you know, places in the United States. Um, oh, wow. Just something fun for the quarantine and, and just remembering, like, how, how great it was. And, and still to this day, you're doing amazing music, too. So um, oh. obviously, I want to touch base on, like, some of the the beginnings of, you know, As I Bleed, all the way up to Messiah and... and um, Northern Curse and, and all that good stuff. Um, so basically, um, I would just like to like ask, how did As I Bleed start like in the beginning? I think it was a matter of um, my then girlfriend had knew somebody who was, who played drums at her school. And uh, I'd always been interested in music and my brother and I used to fool around in the basement, you know, playing guitar and bass and things like that. So uh, through her, I met Sean Fisher, who's a local dude who I believe is still playing music. If not hardcore, he does produce like hip hop beats, but I think you knew that. Yep, yep. Um, so yeah, that's how it started. I met him through her and recruited my brother, then met up with, uh, you know, both Chad and um, Nate Jones, both, well, Chad's back in the area and Nate's in the area pretty much since, so. And as you know, he also played in the network. So, so um, what what did you guys like? Were you trying to be um, like how old were you at that time? Because I I know everybody was fairly young back in yeah. the safe and sound days. Yeah, totally. I was just out of high school, so I was probably eighteen or nineteen. My brother, who's two years my junior, was like seventeen, and I think Sean was about my age or is my age. And I think both Chad and Nate were definitely still in high school. I believe we're like 15 when we recorded our demo and maybe even the first record. So pretty young guys. Yeah. What, what year was the demo actually? What, what year was that when that came out? I would say 96 or 97, maybe. Yeah. Somewhere around. I know. I was on the, uh, I remember I was on the hunt for that for the longest time. I, uh, yeah, I, I, I hit you up on Facebook and then I hit you up on Instagram and, and yeah. uh, nobody could find it. And uh, uh, finally, somebody had actually put it on YouTube just recently, maybe about, I don't know, I would say maybe a month or a month and a half ago. It like, oh yeah, all of a sudden popped up on YouTube and I, I couldn't believe it. And uh, also the uh, the second life passed on was it it was a demo tape right the second life passed yeah, on yeah we did two demo tapes I was on the hunt for that for years and years and years and um, Nick Flanagan who played in um, like uh, Dissension Scots and Farewell Chapter he had oh, okay. the, he had the tape and he told me like we were conversing and, and I couldn't believe that he had the tape and uh, so. Yeah. Yeah, he ripped it for me, and I couldn't believe it because I hadn't I hadn't heard those songs in so long, and and it was good to go back and and listen to them because to me, those were some of my favorite demos. Like, the first life passed on demo and the second one were like, but at that time it was kind of like I didn't hear things that chaotic. I mean, Ukulele the Mock was chaotic, but it, that was like almost on the next level of like chaoticness for you know new hampshire bands and, and and stuff like that i think that's what happens when you don't know how to play so <laughs> you just take everything that you've 
you know, all the music that you like, all the different styles and just mush it together. Yeah. But I think at that time, I know for a fact that I was really into like His Hero's God and, you know, the obvious stuff like Converge and Raven and all those guys from Massachusetts. But also, you know, I really like Disrupt a lot. So again, just really trying to crush all that stuff into one thing. Yeah. Now where all you guys had the same musical taste or, or was there like a, you know, um, you know, uh, somebody liked something outside of the box and tried to fit that into, or were you guys all kind of in the same, like, uh, taste of like what you were doing at that time? I think we were all somewhat in the same wheelhouse. I, I know that Ryan was really into like indecision at the time and bands like Sons of Abraham, like lots of like New York City 90s mosh hardcore at the time. Uh, we had, I mean, who knows what the lineup was back then. Um, Sean from As I Read played drums initially. Yeah. Um, my brother joined. I don't think he was in it. As far as life passed on, I think he joined that shortly after. But we had like, you know, it was one of those things in the 90s where you had like more than one singer, so two singers. There yeah. might have been three guitar players at the time. Yeah. Um, that band was sort of started as a side project, as I believe, because I wanted to play guitar. Um, so I hit up some people that I worked with. Um, Casey Blanchett was a good friend of mine. We worked together. Ryan McKenney of Trap Them, we worked together. Yeah. And our friend Joe. And we just kind of cobbled everybody together. Yeah. But to answer oh. question, I think, I think we mostly all listen to somewhat similar things. Yeah. And Joe was the other singer, right? With the, yeah. him, him and Ryan, if I can remember correctly. Initially, yep. Uh, and uh, miss that guy. Have you heard from Joe at all? Because I, I haven't, I haven't heard or seen Joe in in a long time. I didn't know if you were still uh, touch base with him at all. Yeah, we're friends on Facebook. Maybe he's watching this, uh, or I don't know if he's on Instagram. But we have chatted a few times. Um, I don't think he's into this music at all anymore. But that's you know that's what happens. But yeah, um, I haven't seen him physically in a friendship context in a long time. Um, but he's out there. He's out there. Nice. Um, all right. Now going back to as I bleed. Um, what yeah. after the demo came? Was it the um, split seven inch that came out after the demo with uh, denied reality? Is that what came next? Oh, actually, no. The ten inch came first. The ten so the ten inch, yeah. And I think just because, I mean, technically those songs from the seven inch and the ten inch were recorded at the same time at um, um, spacing on his name, but the bass player from Die My Wills Studio. So that was a great experience too because we love those guys. So yeah, really Die, cool. Die My Will was fucked. Yeah. It was, did, um, did you see the? Oh, you you said the repress of did uh, of the album, the first album, Absolutely. Die My Will. Yeah. I grabbed the shirt because I love. I grabbed the album. Too. Yeah, those guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, so back to that question, I think. Yeah, the seven inch came out after the ten inch, but the songs recorded at the same time, and I believe it was the idea that the label. It was the same label. So it was that label, um, the name's escaping me, but from Germany there, they put out, oh, Voice of Life. Yeah, yeah. Which was an imprint of another popular label at the time, whose name I don't remember. But um, yeah, those 10 inch, then the seven inch, and then we were done. <laughs> so what was, uh, how come, like, how did As I Bleed kind of like go into Life Passed On? Um. Yeah, it was just a it was a side project for me to play guitar because and as I bleed I was just a singer. Yeah. And I really had a desire to play guitar too. And I mean what band you know, what hardcore bands exist where there isn't, you know, ten other bands sprouted from the one band. Everyone wants to be in hundred bands. So yeah, yeah. I really wanted to play guitar and I was looking to do something a little less metal and a little more hardcore grind crust. Yeah. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. And that just blended into what what began as Backstabbers, right? Because I, I exactly. feel like the the two demo tapes and then Evolution are like similar sounding a lot if you yeah. if you like really listen to that, which um you know I I loved back then, you know what I mean. So it was it was it was great either way, you know what I mean for me. Um, yeah. You you're originally from Portsmouth, or where did you like actually grow oh. up? Unfortunately, well I shouldn't say this in case people still love it there, but. My brother and I are from Rochester, which, you know, doesn't have the greatest reputation. But, um, and that was an important thing for us is to not, I wouldn't say lie, but we didn't want to say we were from Boston or, you know, places like that because 
it was important to us that we were from New Hampshire and we kind of always kept that, you know, even though right now in backstabbers, I'm the only one who lives in New Hampshire, but we still say we're New Hampshire Bay. So it's almost the opposite problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so when you guys first started playing shows as I bleed was basically safe and sound was like your home base of like playing shows, correct? Absolutely. That place was instrumental into, I would say, me even starting a band, my brother and I starting a band because there was a place to play. Because without that place, I mean, maybe I would have gone to shows. I think my first introduction to hardcore was actually, came later. Like I started listening to thrash and death metal first and then came into hardcore after the fact. And one of the first shows I went to was at UNH. It was like, um, like Proof Positive, which was some of the guys from that went on to be reaction yeah, and uh, strike three, as you know, Caleb from yep. cave and was in, was in that, and we love those guys. Yeah. So yeah, New Hampshire, like with safe and sound, as you know, you went there a million times, like it became the premier place to play, at least in my opinion, in New Hampshire. I mean, yeah, definitely. We played so many shows there in the beginning that, and we saw some things we might not have seen otherwise. So yes. Yeah. That. Well, that's what I, I, I always say that, um, that people, you know, they think New Hampshire isn't that, you know, it wasn't much of a scene. Everything is in Boston or Worcester or Providence or, but um, back in the day, New Hampshire was, was buzzing back then with Safe and Sound, Cafe Eclipse. Um, uh, Cafe Savoy, I believe too. Savoy in, um, in Manchester, right? Yep. Because the Eclipse was in Concord, right? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then even like Zoots up in Maine. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. The, it was like that little short area of New Hampshire and like right on the border of, of Maine were, were really buzzing at the time. I mean, like like you said, me and you saw a million great shows back then. Uh, and it was every weekend, too. Um, yeah. And I mean, Caven played, Converge played up there, Reversal Man Deep played Reed. up there. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Deep Breed, Deep Breed played, played up there. I mean, like... The who's who of hardcore back in the day, like Fall Silent. Wild um, Child played there. Yes. They came uh, from the West Coast. I mean, pretty much everybody. Yeah. Um, so that's what I always try to say, because it was crazy. And Boston was still having all the, all their shows, too, um, at sure. the time, too. So New England was was like a hotbed of hardcore and, and punk music back in, like, the, you know, mid-'90s to – I mean, it kind of fell off maybe – I don't know, like maybe early 2000s, kind of a little bit. And then it, it ramped back up again, maybe from 2002 to, you know, 2007. And then it kind of went down for shows. For me, at least, I couldn't find as many yeah. shows as, as there were back then, you know? Exactly. Uh, now, Doug was the guy who ran Safe and Sound, right? Is that what his name was, Doug? Yeah, Doug and his whole family, like, I believe lived in the basement, which is crazy but awesome at the same time. That venue initially, well, it was a bicycle shop initially. That's where I got my first bicycle. But also, it started as kind of like an after-school club. And I think, like, Ryan's first band, he'll probably murder me if I ever mention the name, but um, Ryan McKinney's first band used to play there. And they would do, like, yeah, just, like, you know, local high school band stuff. Yeah. And then it might have been Ryan who actually brought somebody like Tree or Sam Black Church up here to play those shows yeah and um i think what doug found was that those shows like the hardcore punk shows metal shows actually started bringing more people so it was kind of a no-brainer for him to start setting up shows like weekly or even like a couple times a week i think part of their problem was that they kind of they might have overdone it so you know kids are fickle you start having two to three shows a week no matter who the bands are kids are going to get tired yeah and um, plus, they were living there, so it was important for them to have as many shows as possible. And um, but he was a great guy; his family was great, and they really, they really just loved having kids. They kind of lived up to the name and sound. They just wanted kids to have a place to go. Yeah, yeah. And he kind of made a, a he he made it a good um, scene for you know if it got too rough, he would always come in, and you know yeah. he he had kicked me out a couple times. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, kicked me out a couple times but then he brought me right back in you know what i mean he's like almost yeah. gave me a time out from being like uh you know m moshing too hard you know what i mean but he was yeah, always yeah. a good guy and uh it, it, nothing really that when i was there wasn't too crazy i know the asuk show um it it got shut down early because there was uh 
you know, a few squabbles in the, in the crowd. I, I, I remember, oh, really? I think they only had played maybe six songs before they, the show got shut down. Was that the show uh, with Reversal, man? It was, it was, uh, I think it was uh, Bastion, um, Frodis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jerome's Dream, Reversal Man, and then Asak played the, the, the um, they were the headliner. Yeah, that was one of, that was actually one of the best shows I'd ever seen there because both Asuk and uh, Reversal Man, I remember, played on the floor in the middle. Yeah. And I had, you know, I liked Reversal Man and I heard Asuk, but they were a force to reckon with live. I, To this day, I'm, I'm like, that was probably one of the heaviest bands I'd ever seen. Yeah, me too. And I wouldn't be playing that show, but we did. So. <laughs> when I, uh, when I, I don't know which one I saw first because I saw them at... Um tin can uh one of the tin can fests that pete okay. from sinaloa did and i'm not sure it, it was like one year after the, you know so i'm not sure which was first um and which wasn't i know uh yeah i don't know i don't know like what year it was but i saw reversal man twice and i can't remember if i had seen the tin can um fest first or or the rochester safe and sound but um like like you said I was blown away. I wasn't really um, introduced to that kind of screamo music at that time. I mean, I went to actually my first experience was Tin Can because I saw Seisha there and um, I never knew who they were. And some kid was like, oh, you got to watch this band. Portrait had played there at that mm -hmm. same show and Force of Glass. And, and um, I was more of a Converge kind of guy and, and uh, you know, just he heavier, like, heavier, yeah. heavier music, you know what I mean? And then I saw that and it blew me away and kind of steered me towards like the screamo aspect of stuff with like 400 years and, and stuff like that. Um, so it kind of was life changing. So when, you know, Rochester blew me away too, when I saw them, um, it was kind of, you know, like I said before, I was kind of a mosher and I had grown up on, you know, uh, New York hardcore, um, like youth sure. of today, youth of today, gorilla biscuits, agnostic front, sheer terror, that, that type of stuff. That was like, you know, the first shows that I went to basically was um, in Boston at the channel, like every sun Saturday and Sunday, they'd have matinees and, and I would go when I was real young. And that was kind of my introduction to that. So those bands kind of steered me into that vein of, of punk and hardcore. Definitely. Um, now, what was your favorite um, show that uh, As I Bleed or Life Passed On played at the Safe and Sound? Can, do, you, do you remember what was like the best show that you guys played? Let's see. I mean, we did play so many because we were kind of local to there. I do remember Life Passed On and As I Bleed also played a lot of shows together because it was just easy. Hmm. But I remember a couple of Halloween shows there that were just super fun where, you know, you kind of own the place. Um, I think anything with Die My Will was always – a special show because those guys just I never wanted to play after them and yeah. I don't thankfully I don't think we did so um but I think some of the Halloween shows are probably the most fun you know you wear costumes and you're just going crazy. do you remember do you do you remember any of the bands that played on those Halloween shows unfortunately I don't and I wish you know and to your credit I wish that more people I think I saw that um Ryan Mason's brother uh, Jamie said this on your last podcast you know people like you kind of like kept you know, videotape things that most people were not paying attention to. And I wish that more people had, because between probably you and maybe the Reverend, you know, like Aaron Epolis, I think if it wasn't for you two, two things, I wouldn't have any pictures or, you know, videos and maybe most bands wouldn't. So um, thank you for that. And I wish, I just wish more people had done that. Cause then I would probably answer your question a little better if I yeah, remember yeah. The played. Well, that's that's the thing too, because I was I was talking to um, I don't know if it was Travis or um, Jamie, but I was saying I saw a bunch of people all the time videotaping, and and somehow <laughs> they never see the light of day. Yeah. Whether you know the tape gets ruined or like I'm constantly searching on YouTube for you know old shows and, and stuff like that. And literally when I was videotaping, there was always I always saw other people on the sides, but they never see the light of day, which is, which is too bad because um, I just wish I could watch, you know, everything from back then, you know, it's, it's tough to remember when we get older and we can't remember it because 
things are fuzzy to me trying to think back 20, you know, 15, 20, 25 years ago. Um, and it, I just think if, like you said, if everybody, you know, kept those, then, you know, it would, it would be very nostalgic for all of us. Um, but, uh, so talk a little bit about, um, how life passed on blended into being backstabbers incorporated. I think at the time, <laughs> this is, feels kind of stupid talking about it now, but, uh, yeah, I think it was simply a couple, we had a couple of situations with our guitarist at the time, Mike, who went on to, you know, the red cord 108 in a million of, I mean, what band hasn't Mike been in? Yeah. <laughs> um, and he's an awesome dude. He's a great guitar player. He's a great musician. I think he's probably a lot more calm now, nowadays. But at the time, like, I remember we had played a show in Revere where I'm sure if Guy is watching this, he will laugh or maybe not. But we had, like, knocked our amps on the floor in this basketball court. I smashed my guitar into the floor. It was just a – it was an odd time in my life, and it was also an odd time in the scene where, like – and this wasn't even about us trying to like one up anyone. It was just like, we were playing in a way that was just, you know, full throttle emotion, you know, all this to simply say that we had a couple of shows like that where we got and got banned a couple places. Um, and which is never our intention. Like when my brother and I set out to play this kind of music, it was not to be, you know, these like show boats smashing guitars and stuff like that. I mean, I was poor. I didn't have more than one guitar. So when I broke that guitar that time, that was it. I had to go find another one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I remember we played a show, I think it was American nightmare. And I think Mike, you know, did his, his thing where he like smashed his guitar and stormed off stage. And, and we had already been banned a couple of places. And I was like, ah, oh, we can't. Cause I think for a little while we were actually doing that swarm thing, you know, where there was like, the swarm was was also known as knee deep in the dick, and so we were kind of doing the same thing. It was life passed on, aka backstabber incorporated? And I think, you know, not that it was this huge secret that we weren't the same band, but I think we just decided to just switch to backstabbers, and I think we kind of kind of leaned a little more on the hardcore aspect and a little less on the metal, and maybe a little less on the grind too. I think we were really trying to. I mean, I've always thought of us as a straight ahead hardcore band, even though most people wouldn't agree to that. But yeah. I think that's what happens. It was a simple, and I think Mike actually ended up leaving the band at that time, at least for a little while. And we just, because I think he came back for Kamikaze Missions. So this was all happening just before that was recorded. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's basically, it. I think it was just a matter of like trying to distance ourselves from this like weird, very short lived, violent past and to become something else. Yeah. It's uh, it's funny that I I still I still have a few uh, flyers from when uh, you guy you guys uh, were playing that I posted that you saw. Uh, like, oh yeah, you said the Sam Black Church. Uh, uh, yeah, played. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean Sam Black Church played there all the time. Yeah, and, um, and I have the the it says um, as I bleed's last show. That's yeah, I saw point. that, and I wondered. I didn't remember we we had a last show. Yeah, I don't know fun. who made this flyer. Um, I made the Sam Black Church flyer, but I I don't know who made this. And uh, it was UFI turned into Exit Twenty Three, right? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh -huh. I think that's what they called. Wasn't it something before the UFI too? Didn't they call it like? I think it was a coffee house of some sort. Yeah, wasn't it like Cafe something? Did um, yeah before U UFI? I can't remember what it was called. Here's like a classic show that that you guys both played as I bleed and life. Oh, overcast. Hell yeah. 40 uh, days. Rain. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That, that show was uh, amazing. What, you know, like one of the best shows that I I've been to back, back then. Um, yeah. You remember that show? Uh, pretty well. I know we played with overcast a few times. And again, another band that totally destroyed 40 days rain was always awesome. Um, but I don't remember that show in particular. Again, I think because safe and sound, not only did they have shows, that I went to twice a week, but I also played some of those. So they get kind of yeah, mixed. But, yeah. Um, and here's one, here's one where the non compost mentis was always oh, yeah. uh, and life passed on. The, um, I love seeing non compost mentis back yeah. then. You, you must've played with them a few handfuls of times. Didn't Absolutely. you? Yes. Definitely. I think this was the overcast show that, Oh yeah, my friend Jake made that flyer. He always made great flyers. <laughs> and uh, I had one more to. Well, obviously the backstab is one that I 
that as the sun um, has failed on uh, on me, I set up this show, and um, this was like the videotape that one of the videotapes that I um, put up on my Instagram. Um, and I wanted to ask you about this show because me and Travis were talking about this show at Merrimack College. As I um, now, do I'm you? Trying, I, that's a great show. I wish I could remember it. All those bands. <sighs> yeah, I'm trying to remember it. Huh. I guess I'm older than I thought. Yeah, it was uh, Pieball, Cave-In, Bane, Barrett. You guys played. Um, I remember yeah. it pretty pretty uh, well just because I remember the Pieball fans were. <laughs> I'd never seen fans like that before. Like, uh, yeah. like I was talking to him. People were making pretend they had like telescopes and they were like dancing all weird and I and it was kind of like something new to me and uh, yeah. I had never seen that plus like you have cave in and, and Barrett where the crowd Barrett, was, yeah. you know I was just watching. listening to Barrett last night actually great band yes um, the funny thing is I had seen Barrett um, in Atkinson New Hampshire before I think it was even before that seven inch came out um, okay. and uh who, what was it Stormfront that, that was, oh. um, that was real, like, that was, uh, who was the singer Stormfront that was, um, so Heigelman, there was, uh, Scott Heigelman. Yeah, Scott, Scott. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was Stormfront, Barrett, and maybe Nailbomb played in, in, oh, Nail Bomb? <laughs> yeah. Damn. How did I miss that? And that was probably the one of the first shows I saw up in New Hampshire because most yeah. of the time I was going to Boston and Massachusetts and that was, I couldn't believe it. It was at like a little community center um, yeah. where old people played bingo and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden this, uh, I think it was maybe uh, uh, Adam and Max from Ookla had told me about that show and, and uh, we went and it was a crazy show there. And if I, if I can remember correctly, I think, uh scott wore a cheetah outfit <laughs> <laughs> while, while he was performing if i can remember correctly which was which was pretty insane to me uh but yeah the, the, like i said new hampshire shows are always wild um did you at were you at the earth crisis show at um savoy when all that crazy stuff went down well, actually i was because it's funny because that was the first time I actually hung out with those guys that day because the one of the guys that set up the show, I'm spacing on his name, but his first name is Mike. So him and I were kind of jamming. This was pre As I Bleed. Yeah. Uh, and he was from Manchester. So he probably had something to do with setting up that show. So he's like, hey, uh, Earth Crisis is playing and uh, I'm going to go out and I've got to take them to go eat. So it was actually the, also the first time I've ever had Indian food embarrassing yeah. but it was delicious and i loved it and those dudes were vegan and you know they were a huge influence on my being vegan but yeah i was at that show and i'd hung out with them beforehand and everything was cool and then whatever happened happened manchester had that kind of violent edge to it at the time i remember yeah yeah and i, I remember that vod um didn't play that show also even though they were they were um on the flyer which okay. Which which I I loved VOD back then I was kind of bummed out but that that show yeah. was just uh, kind of wild in general just with like distrust and and <laughs> the singer had a meat apron on which I, I mean it was just a very very odd show to me um, I kind of just like stood in the back and and you know what I mean I didn't I didn't uh, I I didn't want to uh, dance at all you know I used to be a dance dancer and and a mosher but um, those days were numbered you know what I mean. Absolutely. Um, so the first the first Backstabbers um, album was, was it 2000? Is that what, when you guys first recorded? Hmm. I would have to look, I would say, but probably that sounds about right. I mean, if As I Bleed started in like 96, it might have been, it might have been that first CD, you mean? Yeah, the Evolution CD. Oh, 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 yeah. So what happened with that? So this happened at least twice in the history of Backstabber's Life Passed On, where the Evolution, I think we were actually still Life Passed On when we recorded it. But we were, I think what happened was Trash Art was going to put out the first CD, and we had already recorded, like, we, you know, when you're a young band, you're putting out music, like, all the time. So... 
that first seven inch and that first E were kind of recorded around the same time at two different studios. Yeah. By the time a label picked up the first record, Mitch from Trash Art was putting out the CD. And so they kind of came out at almost the same time, which is really infuriating if you're probably the, you know, the, the owner of either of those labels also as the band. So yeah, um, I don't remember how exactly or why that happened, but it also happened with, I think, Kamikaze Missions and Bear's Bones. I think those kind of came out at very close to the same time on yeah. two different levels. So it's not what you want to do as a band. You want to spread those out a little bit. Yeah. And um, how, how did you um, and Ryan get together back then for um, Life Passed On and then going forward as Backstabbers? I, I remember. I remember. I said I. I had seen you guys forever, though. You guys were always. I mean, if as I bleed wasn't playing and life passed on, I always saw Ryan before then in in the crowd. I always saw. Yeah. I always saw Sean at every single show. He was always in the front. I like every single show I ever been to, and every picture that they have from Safe and Sound or somebody else's video, Sean's standing right there in the in the front. Yeah. Um. How did you actually Absolutely. meet Ryan? So Ryan, so I grew up in Rochester, as I said, uh, Ryan was from Dover, you know, so already we have the clash of the, the towns, you know, Dover and Rochester had their little, you know, in high school, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but so Ryan, I had met him through other friends, you know, who kind of like shared the same friendship group, you know, skateboarding and stuff. And Ryan's first band again, again, who I won't mention because he'd slit my throat in my sleep. Um, he he was already doing a band that was kind of like a rap metal sort of thing. But he also worked at the silkscreen shop that I got a job at. And at the time, which is funny, why this is a funny story is because at the time, like Ryan was decidedly not straight edge and certainly not vegan, but I think he was in a transformation in his life. And so we, he had already been working at this t-shirt shop for some time. And we met through that, you know, basically I think I was having like a vegan barbecue and, it might've been As I Bleed, I think, and maybe some other friends' bands, like my friend uh, Sean and his band and uh, Tristan, who went on to author and Punisher. They had like a kind of like a industrial sort of band. So we played at this vegan barbecue. It was outdoors, actually. And um, I had posted the flyers everywhere and talked about it. And Ryan, so yeah, As I Bleed must have already been going on. So maybe I mentioned it at a show or something. And, and Ryan actually approached me and, and asked if he could come. And of course, you know, I was like, oh, really? Because his crowd at the time were might, might've been some of the people who were like, you know, throwing hamburgers at earth prices or strong front or something, you know, all that stupid yeah, yeah. stuff that existed back then. So I was sort of shocked and surprised, but you know, you know, my friends are good people and I knew that they would be open to having somebody come along and they were. Yeah. And yeah, that's kind of how it started. We started hanging out and before long we were like, not only working together, but in a band together. We actually lived together for a short time. Um, and that's kind of how it started. That's a, that's, that's cool. That's cool. Um, yeah. Um, were you, were you um, good friends with the guys in Ookla or Fault? Cause uh, it seemed like. I knew those guys. Yeah. I knew those guys, but you know, like I think I started knowing them at least the ones that came from those bands when they became network, I knew those guys a little more. Yeah. Um, I saw those guys at shows and we, I'm sure we talked and, you know, I remember being a little scared of, of both those bands cause they had a much rougher crowd, I remember, which is again, seems so stupid now, but um, those were kind of the, some of the shows I remember um, where at safe and sound anyway, where Doug would probably call halt on some people and drag them outside. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, you know, they were very active, you know, members of the scene. So I definitely saw them a lot and, you know, I miss seeing them around, you know, the fact that there's no shows currently because of the pandemic, but also because we're all older now and, you know, you just don't make it out to as many shows. Yeah. When I saw, I watched the one you did with Tim and that was just great to even see his face again, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I uh, try to stay in touch with, I mean, I talked to Max here and there um, mm -hmm. and um, Chris Tremblay, the drummer, um, you know, I follow him. He's uh, like an avid hiker and he takes great uh, photography pictures of nature awesome. and animals. So, I mean, some of those guys are, I know Max lives in, in California now, but um, I had played um, Bulldog, the, one of the guitar players in Ookla and um, um, the bass player of Ookla. We um, 
started a band called Last House on the Left. It was me, um, those two guys, uh, Justin McPherson played drums, and uh, Matt Moeller, uh, Justin Moeller's brother, that used to play in Transistor. Uh, we, w right after Ookla had ended, we started like a little band and, and we, uh, we recorded like a demo, but it kind of like, fi you know, fizzled out after, after a year or so, but, um, it was fun playing with those guys. And, um, you know, I wish, I wish we had gone a little further, you know what I mean? But, uh, and also when in high school sweethearts, uh, Josh, the, our drummer, uh, was the first guitar player, one of the first guitar players in fault too. So oh, okay. like, yeah, so it was like, just like you said, like everybody from those bands kind of played in every other band, you know, it just formed into yeah. a bunch of, bunch of bands. Um, but um, so with Backstabbers, uh, going back to Backstabbers, mm -hmm. the the first thing was, was, um, was it a seven inch or, or was it while you were sleeping? Was, was that the first thing that came out after the, the evolution or? Yeah, I think. The, the seven inch just beat the first CD by weeks or months at that point. And then there was the first CD. Yeah. While you were sleeping. Yeah. And the, and then uh, uh, was the split with advocate, like right after the, the CD. Very great question. That section is a little blurry because we also did the theory history seven inch. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember. I would assume that the Advocate one probably came next. Yeah. And it was in the same year that those two seven inches came out, correct? Yeah. I would say the, Adv the Advocate one came out first because I think we did that because we were going on tour. We needed, you know, we, we love those guys, which are a great band yeah. and um, great dudes. And we needed, you know, we needed something to bring on tour. So why not? And we're touring together. Why not bring a record with both of us on? So I think that the seven inch split with those guys predated the theory record which came out um, probably the same year. You're right. Yeah. And um, how, um, what was some of the, like uh, the tours that you guys did with Backstabbers? What was uh, some of the, like your memorable tours and what band like that you toured with, like stood out back then when you, when you were touring with Backstabbers back, back sure. in the day. Back in the day. Well, I would say the first memorable tour was the one that never happened, which was the one where we booked a cross country tour. I think it was, at least a month and a half, probably two months. And the night, the first night, and this is like, this is the trajectory that Backstabbers has taken. Like everything is a hundred times harder than it should be. So the, the most memorable tour would be the one that didn't happen because our, I think our van caught on fire when Ryan was driving it to the night of the first show. It was like in a gunkwit or something. Yeah. So that was a, that was a kick in the balls. And then, um, we tried to like, I don't think we even played that show. It was at a, you know, it was at this garage and, and Ryan's on the side of the road somewhere with a, a van on fire. Yeah. Well, we tried to, we tried to cobble something else together. I think he took his own money and like a couple days later bought another van from like, if I remember correctly, it was like a, a gunstock shuttle bus maybe. And that also, I think the second he bought it, he tried to drive it and then that died. Yeah. So we had to cancel a whole like, two month tour uh you know our very first tour i think that was after the advocate tour but nonetheless this would have been our first u.s tour and uh sadly we had to cancel that but otherwise i mean we did a you know you, I mean, did, we definitely did, you did a european tour as well right yeah that one would probably one of the more memorable ones just because like as a person i like to travel so i it's like killing two birds with one stone where yeah. you're you're kind of going places you want to go, but also you're playing. So you're kind of working. That was great because it, I think it was my first time in Europe aside from maybe England. Yeah. So we're playing all those places and, you know, having people, you know, know who you are before you get there was always helpful to you. Not a ton of people, but enough that it made you feel, it made you feel good. Yeah. Yeah. So we're fine. Like we did a bunch of uh, shorter ones, but we always like, Again, this goes with our luck. We always end up going on our own, which I don't know. Like, I think most bands would probably suggest you want to bring someone with you. And we just yeah. never, never did. And it was always, I feel like a little detrimental because um, shit happens, you know, you kind of, yeah. it's nice to have a band with you. I yeah, remember we like did kind of like a like sister band to like, like tour with and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Like we would also end up, you know, the way that things got booked sometimes you'd end up like in a cup, like going the same direction as somebody else. Like I remember that's happened with Coliseum. 
Yeah. Um, I think that happened with Crow and Die way back in the day. And some other bands like that, too, where you just end up totally – either they were just there or you're just before them, and you kind of have to deal with that whole thing. Yeah. Now, what's the what's the status of Backstabbers right now? Is, uh, like – are you guys still active? Um, like what's, go what's going on with that? Cause I know was the last thing recorded was MIA, right? Or, or. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that was the last thing recorded. And I think that was actually recorded almost 10 years ago now, which is insane because it came out probably almost five years after it was recorded in the first place, which is also insane. Yeah. And so it's funny to talk about the, you know, the initial inception of the band where you're, I can't remember when things came out because we did so much in the beginning. Yeah. And then, as the time wears on, you do less over a long span of time. And we've always been plagued with, you know, lineup changes for various reasons. Yep. And uh, so the current status is we are still around. I know a lot of people may fall out of their chair right now because we always hear people say, oh, yeah, I love that band back in the day. Or like, you know, or surprised to hear that we are still going. And I, when I say we, there's like three of us now. But yeah. Um, you know, my brother left when he moved to California because he played in, obviously, Backstabbers and also in Northern Curse. Yeah. So that was kind of like a pretty major blow because we actually, we've written, well, I guess I should say I've written in another entire album that almost, maybe not five years ago, maybe three years ago. So I've got an album kind of like waiting. Yeah. But um, out of frustration, I started northern curse because that just seemed like i could get things going in a, in a different direction faster yeah i mean black kind of writes itself you know <laughs> so it's like and i'm a little less like um uh, i don't know i wouldn't say i care less but i'm a little less um intense about how i'm letting it just be what it wants to be yeah so yeah so to answer your question backstab is still going i'm actually writing new songs right now like i was playing earlier uh, we do have um, s this label, uh, Bitter Hearts Records, is actually doing a, I guess it would be almost a 20-year anniversary of Kamikaze Missions yeah. uh, cassette re-release. Oh, nice. So, yeah, so that will be coming out, um, you know, I don't want to say this year, but shortly. Yeah. And um, I think within that same time frame, I'm hoping that Backstabbers can – take these songs that I'm writing now and release something new. Yeah. They will be independent of the stuff I've already written for the other, for this record. That's not, hasn't seen the light of day yet. Yeah. But um, this is just like, I mean, there's so much, I mean, being a hardcore, like former hardcore punk person, there's so much insane things happening in the world right now. I, I'm, I'm clawing at the walls to release some music at this time. Because yeah. Yeah. That's what I use as my voice. Like, posting stuff on instagram or facebook like yeah i could do that but one of two things i'm like preaching to the converted or or like you know I'm, I'm i'm battling with you know high school friends and uh you know maybe family members or something you know whose whose uh allegiance allegiance may not align you know so music is the way that i do it yeah. and with so much going on it's it's like i feel like I could write 10 records, you know, it's like yeah. every day you go on the news and you're like, Oh my God, like, how is this? This should be, I mean, 2020 should be the best year of hardcore probably since hardcore became a thing. I mean, I mean, I also don't pay attention to a whole bunch of new music, so maybe it is. And I'm just not paying attention. <laughs> yes. So, well, I mean, I, I, th I mean, I think there was like a resurgence of like hardcore and, and like the screamo scene, the past like year or two because i had seen uh, like i don't i don't hear too much new stuff myself but um i am exposed here and there through friends and it seems like it the, the scene itself and shows are starting to pop up more before obviously this uh, yeah. pandemic hit but all the, it, it seemed like it was coming to a head and then this happened and um you know uh you're right i think this year would have been an explosive year for underground like punk and hardcore music. And um, unfortunately, um, you know, it, it's, it is what it is this year. And um, so, I mean, it, it, it's, it's crazy. Uh, like I said, I think a lot of people are probably writing a lot of music just because there's, there's nothing else to do except maybe like be creative. Like the creative juices must be flung with a lot of musicians that can't 
play shows or or even like some some of them can't even get with their other fellow musicians to practice yeah, or, or do I whatever you know what i mean like i haven't practiced with the guys in northern curse since march basically when this all started mm. um we have a pra- you know i live in new hampshire those guys live in in massachusetts and we practice in boston or somerville rather yeah and uh personally like i just haven't felt comfortable going to we practice at studio 52 because there's like you know, hundreds of people who go in and out of there all the time. Yeah. Like I know those other guys, the dudes in my band also play in another band called Stagnator. And I know that they practice, but, um, you know, for me, like it's a, it's an hour drive anyway. So it's yeah. like, until we can play shows again, I'm just going to take this time to write music, which is exactly what I'm doing, you know? So. Yeah. Um, so how did Northern Curse uh, come about? Um, it's, it's kind of a different uh, avenue for, for you um, yeah. from, the, from the hardcore vein, you know what I mean? What, what kind of spurred that on? Um, that was, you know, my endless frustration with backstabbers and lineups changing and things like that, where it was a constant, you know, I get a couple people together and stuff kind of falls apart. We do a tour, something falls apart. Um, and like I was saying a few minutes ago, I think black metal – is something I've always been interested in. And I mean, if you go back to even like Kamikaze Missions, like I sort of, you know, put a little taste of that in, in the hardcore anyway, because yeah. I think it really complements hardcore, especially dark hardcore or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I started as like a side project with a good friend of mine. Um, it was just me and him. Like I wrote a bunch of songs. Then I think my brother, I pulled Brian from Backstabbers, you know, to, to play second guitar. Um, we recorded a demo, which is up on our band camp. Yeah, which is amazing, which is amazing. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so we put that out, and, you know, much to what I've been speaking of before, you know, lineup changes, like my friend Jeff decided to leave. I brought in Mark from Backstabbers. You know, I'm just trying to, like, get a few people that I can use in all my projects because yeah. that seems to be the best way to go. And because I don't go to as many shows these days as I used to, it's harder to find new people. But all this to say, like, uh, you know, Northern Curse was started as uh, you know, a way to do some other music that I could start fresh with. You know, Backstabbers being around so long and sort of mostly inactive in the way that we don't play a lot of shows. And trying to write music, like, in a band like that where I've already written, I don't know, you know, what, 30 songs, 40 songs. Yeah. It's hard to not repeat yourself so it's about you know doing a different style of music like black metal and also loving black metal anyway yeah it's like kind of a no-brainer um and at this point you know now i have mark from backstabbers on drums and we brought in um a good dude by the name of anthony who plays bass for us who's also in stagnator um so now it's basically the same guys so it's it's yeah. us three backstabbers and us three in northern curse yeah. and uh, we did record a brand new record which we've been sitting on uh, again, basically since last fall because of the pandemic. So we finished yeah. recording this 10 song album. Um, we were trying to figure out label situations and all that. And then right as we got the masters, you know, pandemic hit and it's like, damn it. Like I can't seem yeah. to catch a break. So that has a brand new record out. I'm really excited about it. I think it sounds great. I think people really like it. Um, we did play some shows before, the lineup change in that band yeah um so it's just a matter of like when stuff is safe again we'll definitely be out there and hopefully at that time we'll have this new record in our hand and so maybe in the next couple of weeks i'll post up one of the songs you know as we're talking to labels and whatnot yeah um just so, so what um f- from the pandemic is that kind of how messiah started just because of of just kind of being quarantined and all that or or was that kind of before quarantine had hit yeah well that's a hundred percent uh pandemic project it's actually based off i had another uh project a couple years back called ode which was kind of like a similar thing so yeah it was my you know desire to you know keep ripping off god flesh until the day i die so um i basically you know you're locked in i can't work i can't go anywhere i can't see anybody so I dusted off my old drum machine and was like, I'm going to have something new at the end of this pandemic. Yeah. Um, and that was basically, I wrote three songs. I called in um, Anthony from Northern Curse Backstabbers to yeah. to kind of play bass and to add all the um, 
you know, industrial sort of elements and soundscapes. Yeah. And if and when we play live, which I hope we will, uh, Mark from X Divers will be playing drums live. Yeah. So that's a 100% quarantine pandemic. Like all the lyrical content is about the pandemic and, you know, yeah. the the current administration's utter, complete, disastrous failures. Um, so again, it was like being angry about that situation, needing an outlet for it, taking that and then turning it into some music that I can do on myself. I mean, I recorded that in my apartment with my iPad, like nothing else. So. Wow, that sounds really good for like, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I'll, I'll give the credit to, to where it's due for Anthony because I basically recorded it on my iPad, sent it to him. All the vocals I did like shouting in my van like late at night and then I yeah. sent them. So he took that those elements and made them into something. Yeah. But I'm happy with it, you know. At the I mean, end of the day. A, it's a testament to you too that, that you, you've – had that fire inside you to do heavy music like i like i was talking to you on instagram before like it's it's i think it's amazing that that somebody like you and and a bunch of other people that are our our ages are still you know have the fire burning inside to do heavy music and it gives them an outlet to like you know whether it be you're you're releasing you know emotion that's that's built up or whatever um i i feel that like you and a bunch of the other people that are our ages that are still doing this music it, it's it's amazing and uh i love to see it you know what i mean i i know it's a young man's game but it's like uh <laughs> i love seeing it you know what i mean and and i and i'm drawn to um may, maybe it's an age thing but i'm drawn to like guys like you because it's just amazing that it's such a long period of time and it's you're still you know, it's still going on in your heart. And, and you know, um, I just take my hat off to you. Thank you. I mean, it's, I, I guess I can honestly say at 43, I didn't expect this was going to happen. I mean, it just comes naturally. It also, I mean, you know, look at the world. It's like hard not to be angry. I mean, I could go out there and, and ignore it, or I could, you know, have conflicts with people on the internet you know, and people troll, but I don't know. I mean, this is what hardcore is all about, right? I mean, it's about a way to express yourself in a positive way to maybe inspire and influence other people. Yeah. At the end of the day, like, I'm not trying to change anyone's mind. I'm really just, about, you know, trying to do something positive for me. And I have to say, like, on the other side of the coin, something I did not expect that was going to happen was that people would still give a shit, like, you know, yourself, like other people who, you know, from time to time will, message me about, you know, backstabbers and say that it was important to them. And, you know, as a guy coming from like Rochester, New Hampshire, who didn't know how to play guitar, doesn't know how to play guitar, who just does what I do. The fact that people still care, you know, I mean, I, it's, I couldn't really ask for anything better than that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right. We have about seven minutes. So I'm going to, I'm going to pump you with some rapid fire questions real quick. Uh, like I do every every uh, discussion. Um, my first question is, uh, what is your favorite New England punk hardcore band of all time? Oh, boy. Um, well, I would say, okay, this is an easy one, actually. I'd say Die My Well. And I know I've you know said this a billion times, but huge influential on stage um, and the way they carry themselves as people. Super nice guys. And that is something I've taken to the grave. Yeah, great band, great band. Uh, my second question is, uh, what was the first punk hardcore show? You might have already uh, answered this, that, that you attended, um, that you were, uh, you know, witnessed the very first one. I think it was one of those ramp fests at UNH, and that was with Proof Positive. The two bands I remember were Proof yeah. Positive and uh, Strike Three. Uh, my next question is, all-time favorite punk hardcore show you played in, in any one of your bands? Uh, what was the most, uh, you know, special special shows for you sure um i would say wolves in the throne room when uh, northern curse played with them at the space in portland um i would say when backstabbers this was a more recent show but backstabbers play with pig destroyer at um harper's ferry i think it's called or maybe it's changed the name and then um we hadn't really touched on this band, but I sang for Leash for a couple of years. Yeah, that's right. I we forgot to bring it up. That's right. We played with um, DRI, which, you know. Really? Again, wow. DRI, wow. Yeah. 
Where, I mean, where, I, where was that at? That was at Portland, uh, at Geno's. Uh, wow. Yeah. wow. I saw I saw DRI a couple times way back in the day. I saw him at uh, Club Babyhead in Providence for the oh, wow, yeah. four, four of a Kind tour, which was crazy back then. Yeah. Um, I miss the I mean, Crossover tour. Some, yeah, I love DRI. Gave us oh. like, they gave us a run for our money. I mean, they were they were way older, but they, you know, they put us to bed, so... <laughs> <laughs> All right, my next question is all time favorite punk hardcore show you attended like but didn't play. Like okay. that, that you watched. Oh uh, boy. I'm just gonna go what's coming right off the top of my head. I remember seeing Path Resistance in Syracuse on New Year's Eve. Like that was awesome. And any pretty much any Earth Crisis show, like that was a religion to me. Vegan straight edge, like heartfelt music by yeah. heartfelt people. Yeah. You um, still do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, what was the last movie you watched? Oh boy, it was probably something <laughs> really embarrassing. I always watch stuff when I'm writing music. So, um, what would it have been? It was probably what's that movie with Keanu Reeves and uh, the surf movie? Oh, uh, Point Break. Yes, I had never seen it. I don't know anyone who knows me knows I love '80s stuff. So the fact, well, that was actually '90s, but. That was the last movie I watched. Yeah. Point break. Okay. Um, my next question is, uh, if you've been listening to hip hop, what have you been listening to? Ah. You know, I love that you post all these videos of hip hop stuff, but I have to say, like, I don't really follow hip hop all that much. Like, my favorite all time is probably Soul. Like, you know that dude? Yeah. Soul with yeah. the Anticon guy from yeah, yeah. the early 2000s. He was actually from Portland, Maine. Oh, really? And, I didn't know he was from Portland. Yeah. He probably moved out west, but. I've always loved all the Anticons, Anticon like, record label stuff. I should actually ask you who you suggest. So send me an email or a text message later with some hip-hop that you would suggest. Yeah, I mean, I'm stuck in the 90s for hip-hop because I don't really like the new new era of hip-hop. But uh, there's still um, new bands that, I mean, new new rappers um, and MCs that still still – embrace that 90s style so it's not all like the trap music and stuff like that it, yeah they, it, they still embrace it which is great i'll, I'll send you i'll send you a, a few um but the, if you want if people dig in the crates they can find the music they they want to yeah. get on hip-hop nowadays too even you know but i'm a 90s guy like i i love yeah. you know tribe called quest de la soul um it was weird because yeah, I stopped nice. going, I, it was weird because i stopped going to hardcore shows for like a little span and then all i was going to was hip-hop shows and like just recording hip-hop shows it was like yeah. it was weird but and then this past couple of years i started going back to uh you know going to hardcore shows and stuff like that but i had only seen maybe classic hardcore shows this past year it was like murphy's law agnostic front i saw mm -hmm. Uh, I went to the Jerome's Dream uh, show in Somerville when they came back uh, last year. So um, just trying to get back into the hardcore thing, you know, but it sucks right when I get back, it's, it's <laughs> this, this thing happens. So, um, and my final question is uh, DC or Marvel? Oh, you know, I don't actually don't follow comics whatsoever, including the movies, not a big fan. No, yeah. Uh, I, I just had to ask because. Uh, <laughs> no, not from. <laughs> um, now with with uh, we got two minutes left. Um, you still being um, was as I bleed a straight edge band or was? No, it, my brother and I definitely were, and I believe you know all those guys were back then, but they were also like fifteen. So does it really count? I don't know. But uh, no, we weren't uh, decidedly a hard, uh, straight edge band. I think we were just all straight edge. And yeah, yeah, um, kind of right. <laughs> yeah, I just had, I did, I like because I always associated you guys with being straight edge just because um, sure. I mean you, the tattoo that you had um, and and a lot of you guys had X's on your hands when you played and stuff like that. So I just uh, I just assumed back in the day that you guys were. Um, yeah, but uh, we got a minute left, and I just want to uh, thank you again. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, like I love staying in touch with you, and and yeah. you know chatting about old times and new times and the new music that you have and stuff like that. I, I'm super appreciative of, uh, you know, the music you do now and, and uh, just staying in touch with you in general, you know, it's been, uh, you know, whether, whether it was me setting up shows or, or me seeing you guys somewhere or, or back in the day at safe and sound. Um, it, it's, it's just good, been great to, you know, and finally touch base with you again and, and, uh, you know, finally see your face. It's been, you know, well over a decade that I've seen you. So, uh, I just want to thank you and, and 
again, uh, thanks for taking the time off to do this. Thanks so much for having me. I, re I appreciate it. All right, man. Um, I'll talk to you soon. We got about 20 seconds left and the IG cuts us right off. So uh, <laughs> like again, have a good night and uh, I'll you talk too. to you. Soon. All right. Take care. All right. Thank you.